Uh, just a, a very brief uh, introduction to the Enterprise Network Solutions Group at Worldwide. And so what we have within this practice, and our, this is a business development or pre-sales practice, and we help our customers, we help our field, we work with OEMs, we develop solutions um, out of this very complex world of technologies. So we have, and I'm sorry the quality of the projector here, but we have essentially five different groups that we are five different what we call disciplines and they're fairly straightforward one of them is data center switching another one is campus and branch we have high-end routing and optical we have enterprise mobility and then we also have software defined networking and so what I'm going to talk about today is where we've been in software defined networking over the past two years and also what we're seeing in our customer base right now so when we started this out two years ago Software-defined networking was a very different topic than what we have today. The last co uh, column that you see over there on the right is um, I do have three engineers that do nothing but develop new innovations and solutions inside of the Advanced Technology Lab. All right, so who can tell me, not from worldwide, what does ATC stand for? Last advanced technology, what? Center. Center? Okay, congratulations. You get a cup of coffee. <laughs> so now that I have your attention. <laughs> now that I have your attention, let's keep let's move on. So software defined networking was a term that was coined in about two thousand six. And software-defined networking is, in my mind, the new cloud. Meaning someone in a marketing department said, what can we do to get our customers excited? What can we do to, to move technology forward? What can we do to change things? What can we do to make things easier? Uh, what can we do to save money? And all of those descriptions now became software-defined networking. So it's received a lot of hype over the past two to three years. Uh, and some of the articles you see here are just clips off of, off of the, off the internet and different opinions of what software defined networking is. Is it real? Is it not real? Is it ready for prime time? Is it not ready for prime time? So we're, worldwide, we got into this about two years ago. We started studying this to figure out exactly what people meant by software defined networking. And this slide here is, is a pretty good idea, or what we see a lot, is it's a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So if you talk to a vendor, it's one thing. If you talk to someone in academia, it's a very different thing. If you talk to a customer, generally they don't know what it is. But the fact of the matter is, is software-defined network impacts a lot of different technologies across a lot of different areas of networking. And we'll dive into that a little bit. So with software-defined networking also comes a whole new group of, of words, acronyms, whatever you want to talk about it. I talk, call it alphabet tech soup. So now we have a number of new terms out there like ACI. We have OpenFlow. We have NFV. And these, even for the networking folks, are, are very new concepts. And a lot of people don't know what they are. And there's one of them out there that's even almost completely out of context, and, that, and that's... You look at open flow, a lot of people confuse that with a server technology or a cloud technology called OpenStack. So for a number of years, people would come and say, I want you to come talk about open flow. We would show up and start talking, and they're like, what are you talking about? I wanted the cloud technology. So there's still a lot that we have to go through in terms of defining what all the different aspects of SDN are but I basically boiled it down to pretty much one thing, and that's network programmability. If you think about the goal of SDN, it's to remove complexity from the deployment of an environment or a technology. Okay, so you're not removing the, tech, the complexity from the infrastructure. It's still there. You ever hear of... Um, guy named uh, Tesla, not Tesla, not the electrical guy, but Tesla was the guy that developed the interface for the Macintosh. So think about, now for those of you who are younger, you probably don't realize that Macintosh, or that Apple computers used to have a command line interface that was not far off from MS-DOS. 
So that was a complex thing to use. You had to know what to type. You had to type it in. And so what Tesla did is he said, I'm going to make it easier on the user and give them, you point and click, and it starts an application. Well, the same stuff still has to happen. I've only taken that complexity of knowing the commands and physically typing it in and moved that on to a programmer. And now I've made it easier on the person actually using the computer. This is a very good analogy, really, of how SDN works. You think about what SDN is doing. I'm still doing very much the same things, but I'm doing it in a programmatic fashion. And there's a number of different ways to achieve that inside of SDN. So why do we even need it? You know, what are the business cases behind SDN? If you think about networking, we've been doing the same thing for 20, 30 years. We're pretty good at it. It's, you know, it's a fairly stable thing at this point. There's a lot of standards out there. Why is it that we need to change it? And really, there's several SDN drivers out there. And I think the biggest one that comes to mind for me, and I have more of a data center background than anything, uh, than anything but it is the cloud. It is the data center. Uh, the data center is an interesting place because it is a, a contained space. There's typically four walls to the data center, and it's very easy to change things in there than it is to change things across a wide area network or a backbone network. So the data center is a very logical place to do it. And also, one other thing that we've had show up is what's workload mobility. So after the, the folks from the virtualization companies figured out how to use hypervisors to move workloads from one machine to another seamlessly, now suddenly the network folks had to figure out how to do that as well, or how to accommodate that. And then how to expand that and scale it as well. Another thing that we're seeing is video. So in video, uh, you know, I know for me, um, I would much rather consume information through video than reading a PDF. It takes a long time to read a PDF. You only have sort of that one avenue of information. So if I'm watching video, I have audio. I'm actually seeing something happen. They can do demonstrations. And you consume that information at a much higher rate. Well, people are figuring that out now to the point where if you look at what's going on on the internet and with things like Netflix and YouTube, approximately 60% of all the traffic on the internet right now is video traffic. So how do I deal with that? Because with video comes quality of service. How do I do quality of service? How do I increase bandwidth? How do I be dynamic about those different environments? If somebody does something stupid on YouTube and now suddenly everybody wants to watch it, how do you adjust for that type of condition? So that's been another driver around SDN. Also mobility. How many people have multiple modal, mo or mobile devices? I know my laptop and I know my phone in my pocket. Um, if I'm carrying my iPad, I have that as well. Uh, so we see more and more people having more and more devices. How do you manage that? You know, each one of them has an IP address. Each one of them has information coming into it. Um, roaming from one spot to another. How do I deal with those types of conditions? And then finally, the simply the amount of data that's out on the data or on the internet right now. So we used to talk about terabytes and petabytes. And now the unit that we're using to describe traffic on the internet is a yottabyte. So my question is, how much is a yottabyte? There we go. Got some in my pocket. 10 to the 18. I don't know that. Is that close? Oh, she's looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> she's using the internet. <laughs> what? I know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> we can guess the answer. All right. All right, let me ask a question. Is it more than a million terabytes? No. It's a lot more. It's yeah. a, each yottabyte is a trillion terabytes. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this just for the effort. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a yottabyte is a trillion terabytes. And you know, the big data guys, I can see them thinking already right now. We could do a lot with that. Yeah, so, so how, much, how much data is available on the internet right now? And the estimation is there's between 14 and 16 yottabytes of storage on the internet today, and it's growing exponentially. 
How do you deal with that? Okay? We can't do it through the same static ways we've been doing for years and years. So what are the requirements for this next generation network? And if you think about it, what everybody's always talking about is agility. I have to be able to change the condition of my network to meet the business need. How do we do that today? Uh, and, now, and from a corporate perspective, that allows me to adopt new transitions to in the market. And I always go back to, now this dates me a little bit, but how many people remember Pet Rocks? So if they were selling Pet Rocks, that was before the internet. They're selling Pet Rocks today, and somehow you convinced everybody that they needed to go buy a Pet Rock. You better be first to the market before people realize that they're buying a rock. Okay? So if you have that capability and that agility to make that change before your competitors, and that's sort of a flippant example, but if you have that capability and ability to make that change that fast, you're going to be ahead of your competition. The other thing is simplicity. So when we start talking about programmatic networks and we start talking about all of these changes, somehow we have to make this simple to enable the change. Now, my favorite statement, and it was actually uh, by, um, by a, guy, a, a guy who invented a storage company, but his, his statement was, simplicity is not simple. Somebody has to do the work, the work that needs to be done somewhere. Go back to Tesla's law of conservation of complexity. You can't get rid of it. All you can do is shift it around. So the way you deal with, and again, I apologize for the slides, the way you deal with this complexity is through automation. Yes, you do the work. You do it once. You do it programmatically. Then every time you do it after that, it's a button push, one after the other. And if you've ever worked with any of the systems out there that do policy-based networks, where you create that policy up front, and then you use that policy to build things, you know what I'm talking about. I also refer to it as the industrialization of IT. So if you, bought, if you went out to buy a car in the 1900s, someone stick-built a car for you. And if you wanted to go and get another car, you would have another car that was stick-built, but probably not exactly the way that you exactly the same as the first one you bought. Fast forward to Henry Ford. So he built components and put them on an assembly line and allowed people to take components and very quickly and very easily and very consistently build automobiles. It's the same thing in networking today. We have to stop going in command line by command line, device by device, building a network and then going back and doing it again we need to build policies and pools and profiles and use those elements or those objects to build our networks. And then finally is business value. And what it comes down to really is the last one, cost savings. So if nothing else drives this, if you can save a company money, they'll do it. So a lot of companies go to outsource uh, conditions. And they do that thinking that they'll save money, whether or not it's the right technical decision. So one of the big drivers here is if a company can show you that you can save money, you can help them monetize their network, they're clearly going to move in this direction, and we're starting to go there now. So as network engineers, what have we been building? Everybody probably recognizes this. You've probably drawn the same picture. Redundant, highly available, lots of different links. If something fails, you know, it essentially it's Stonehenge. It's stable. It's solid. It's reliable, but what's the problem with Stonehenge? It doesn't move around a lot, okay? It doesn't change. So, but we've been paid to build these things. For those of you who may be in our operations, if you can build that and you can keep it running, you're going to get paid, but if you start knocking things down, your paycheck suffers. That's another big incentive here as well. So let's look at the evolution, and again, why do we want to change? Why do we want to move? And if you look at compute and storage, They've evolved rather well since 2005. So I was around when, you know, it, I was in data center when networking came out. Uh, I'm sorry, when virtualization came out. And if you remember the first ESX host, VMware 2.0, it ran in the lab. Nobody in their right mind would put it in production. Okay? It was great to do dev test with that. Not too many people were using it. Suddenly it broke out into production. And we very, very quickly started to virtualize. We very quickly started then to automate, and through scripting usually. Then we did orchestration and cloud. So 
you look at the acceleration and the change in the compute and the storage world over the past 10 years, and it was remarkable. So how did we do in networking? <laughs> OK, so I put 1992 up there. And I'll, again, I'll show my age here. But I started doing networking in 1992. I bought, if any of you remember, a company, Calpana. They eventually they were acquired by Cisco along with Crescendo. But I had the, my serial number two Calpana switch. In 1992, I was configuring that through Telnet into a cable. And for those of you who don't know what CLI is, I hear the question over here, it's, it's command line interface. So I would go to each box and I would type the commands into it. In 2014, I've been, I was doing the same thing. So we have not changed how we configure and manage network devices for, ne for 25 years or more. And again, that, that's a problem that we have here. So the hard fact is, is that despite the advances in hardware and ASICs and even software, we're still, we, the networking folks, are still behind uh, those that are in compute and storage in the two factors that really matter in business, and that's agility and mobility. How can I change fast enough to keep up with the needs and the desires of the business? So I had another thought about this, too. And I'd just say, all right, let's, let's think about stability and agility. And the more I thought about them, the more I thought that that is an oxymoron. Okay? If I have something that I want to be very stable, I'm not going to move it around. If I want something that I want to move around very quickly, I'm not going to build it so that it can't be moved. So this is really a little bit of a dilemma that we're going through right now. So let's talk about where we are today. Um, today's networks, and this is circa probably a year ago, because I think there's been some change here. In today's network, they're essentially built the way that they were built back in the 80s. And that's in a box by box sort of a configuration. You buy a box, and I, I put a bunch of things in here. Each of those box has separate policy. They're using distributed algorithms. So I'm talking about things like spanning tree and, and some sort of routing protocol. But that allows them to be federated into a single community of devices. Now, the idea back then is this was derived from ARPANET uh, back in the 80s. And the great story is that they did this so that if ever there was a, you know, a, a, a nuclear bomb that went off, for example, in Washington, DC, since all these devices were autonomous, then the rest of the network would survive. And unfortunately, that's all just a story. The real reason is, is that at the time, circuits were very unreliable, and devices were unreliable. And even though there was not a nuclear bomb, a lot of these things went down, a lot of circuits went down, and they still had to be resilient enough to stand and run on their own. Now, obviously, that's changed a lot over the past years. So this is the traditional network before SDN. And let me, let me talk a little bit about where we're moving from and moving to, just in a general sense. And then the slides will make more sense. So if you look at those networks that we built, where we had autonomous devices, that meant that the control plane, meaning the programming aspect of the box, and the forwarding plane, which is the piece that actually shot the packets out the ports, resided on the same box and were intimately tied together, and still are in a lot of cases. If you go out and buy a Cisco router that's running iOS, you cannot separate that hardware from that software. OK, now, there's other operating systems. Yes, you can do that now. So if you look at, for example, NXOS, I can run the control plane completely separately from the hardware. So one of the basic tenets that you'll find around software-defined networking is getting away to a certain extent from having a control plane intimately tied to the, the forwarding plane. Now, the other problem with having each device using and owning a control plane is that there's no real global view of the own network. They only have a view of themselves and what's next to it. And they rely on those federation mechanisms to understand the topology of the network. So again, another problem that we want to do, or we want to solve. So with SDN, that there was, there was an early view. There was an early concept of SDN. And this generally came out of the academic space. 
So if you look at the Stanford's and the Clemson's and the Wisconsin's, a lot of the, a lot of the universities where they do a lot of research, their first premise was, let's go ahead and separate the control plane from the forwarding plane. The devices that actually forward the packets are relatively dumb. They just have to do what we tell them. Let's take all the intelligence and put it into a centralized control plane, which we'll call a controller. And now that controller will have a global view of, of the network. I don't want to say the world because that's not realistic. So they would have a global view of the network. And the idea there is I would have an end-to-end -end view of how a packet flowed through a network. And in that case, I could do a lot more interesting things than if I have to go in and configure each box individually. So now I'm doing what's defining flows. So first protocol we see to do that is something called OpenFlow. And so OpenFlow came largely out of the academic community. It said here is OpenFlow is a protocol that, was, that basically allowed the controller to communicate with the forwarding plane. And the controller then is where you did all of the configuration and received all the feedback from the network. And it seemed like a, a, a great idea. There's a lot of the open standards are inside of this. Um, there's commonality in here. So now you have, you have a singular, what's called southbound protocol, which is OpenFlow. And then you have a common northbound protocol, which is how you talk to the controller. So you can talk to the controller essentially through an HTML you know, REST API. And it's very simple. And I can now have multiple applications where I can have higher level orchestrators talk to this. And it seems like a pretty good idea. But in order to do this, if I wanted to say, OK, I'm company XYZ. I want to go do this. What do I have to do? Well, rip out all the boxes that you have and replace it with boxes that can, that can support OpenFlow. And so there's usually a little bit of a pause there. Um, and then the other thing is these network operating systems that have been built by vendors over the past 25 years are complex things. There's a lot of research and a lot of experience in there. So whoever's writing the software for that controller better know what they're doing. And so now we, now we see that um, people are now looking back to the vendors a little bit for help on this. So this was, you know, when you, when you talk to the open flow con community, very often it's academics, very often it's people who have an open source sort of mentality. Now some vendors have adopted open flow as their primary mechanism, but usually there's a value add on top of it. And that's where the standards are used, but I'm going to add a whole lot on top of that standard. So this is what it would look like if you took that previous network and you spun it into a software-defined networking. So now up at the top there, that there's no control planes on the boxes. And so now the controller is the only place where you can put information into that system so that it knows how to write or how, knows how to work. So now there's a little bit more of a current view out there because we find that there's um, there's a lot of restrictions to running, first of all, a single southbound protocol. And then also there's restrictions to removing the control plane from all these vice devices. So now it sounds I'm like I'm backing up a little bit, right? I'm like, here's Utopia. We have a single brain, and it controls all the devices in the network. Uh, and they say, that's a great idea because it allows me to see the whole network and do end-to-end -end flows. And, be very effective in configuring things like quality of service or ACLs, where it really does help to have that entire view. But the downside is, is if I have one controller, what about the device that's 3,000 miles away? Maybe there's a little latency involved with that. Okay. What if I have devices that don't, don't understand that southbound API? What do I do about that? So you saw sort of the next phase of SDN, which I'll refer to this as a current view. And that is what I refer to also as, the, as a hybrid view. So a couple things happen in the hybrid view. In the hybrid view, for example, on the, the switch or the router that's in the network, I can run not only an open flow protocol, but I can also run a native control plane. So I can have some ports say, OK, you're part of this controller in the sky. But the other parts are saying, just keep running iOS or just keep running whatever operating system you're doing. 
and that allows you to adapt to a software-defined networking environment rather than doing a big bang. The other thing that it does is it allows you to have multiple southbound APIs. So OpenFlow is still certainly one of the APIs that you can use from the controller down to the device. But why not use some other protocols as well? Let's think back, you know, legacy-wise, why not use CLI? Now, it's not the most efficient, but what it does allow me to use is not swap out all my gear. Just about everything out there understands CLI. But now, rather than me typing in the commands, the controller is going to take care of that for me. So I can still do it faster. I can do, still do it more consistently. If I'm in the service provider space, what they've used for years there is a protocol called NetConf. Why not use that? Sure, why not? And then a lot of the vendors have started coming out with what we refer to as vendor-specific APIs. So I'm a Cisco. I want to expose a, a service out of my router, but I don't want to remove the control plane completely, so I'm going to still run that control plane, but I'm going to allow an override mechanism that allows a controller to come in and directly access a service inside of that router. So now we've got a whole lot more toys to play with. We have a whole lot more mechanisms that we can use for that. So here's what a typical controller would look like. Um, so if you look up at the top here, and I'll translate some of this for you. Um, up at the top are your applications. And your applications can either be applications that somebody writes, or they can be cloud products, or it can even be OpenStack. Remember OpenStack? That's that cloud thing. Now you're seeing more and more of a connection between OpenStack and SDN. Because if I can build a cloud environment quickly and I can build the network underneath of it, that's, that's a double win. So at the very top, the things up there in the blue are the applications or the programs that are going to talk to the controller through that northbound REST API. And again, that REST API is common. And the commands that you send to that controller are vague. And what I mean by that is all of them are basically, you know, if I want to create a VLAN, they're just saying create a VLAN and call it VLAN 20. It's now up to the controller to use the appropriate southbound API to relate that request to a specific action on this downstream device. And this may vary from one device to another. With one, it may be CLI. Another one, it may be OpenFlow. Another one, it may be NetConf. Another one, you may be talking you know, to one of the vendor-specific APIs. But you have that capability of, of, that, or of those multiple different southbound APIs, the multiple different ways. So now, let's, let's look at what we had with OpenFlow, where I had that, that open northbound API. OK. I had a controller. OK, controller-based networks are fairly common. Um, I used to have, I had to have OpenFlow support supported devices using running OpenFlow protocol. OK, that was a limit. Now I can use the stuff that I've already got in my network. So rather than doing a hardware replacement and then putting the controller on there, I can put the controller in, migrate from a, from a, a operating system that is native to the device to a controller-based operating system. Or if the gear can't handle it, I can run it in I can run a hybrid of southbound mechanisms to talk to those networking devices. So now I can deploy this a whole lot faster than I have before. <coughs> so if, just a sort of a little rewind here, because there's always someone in the office, or, or, all right, who's an IBM? Who worked on mainframes? Yeah, I knew. I could, I could tell. I don't know how. <laughs> so, so the mainframe guys are going about, well, what about SLDC? We've had this for a long time, since, what, 1903? You know, nothing's new. We've done everything on the mainframe forever. Is that pretty much it? Yeah. So, so basically, um, SDLC was the same sort of mechanism. I had a primary or a controller that managed all the other devices or all the other aspects of that particular uh, connection in SNA. Um, if you look at a more modern technology, uh, call something called PFR, or performance routing. And this is a Cisco technology where I'm going to determine the best path through a network by having 
a head end or a controller, if you will, that understands the topology and the conditions of the network underneath of it and makes adjustments to how packets are routed based on whatever you want to specify, whether it's the application type or whether it's latency or whether it's jitter or bandwidth or whatever. So, so that's a controller uh, network as well or the control plane separation. And then usually I really get hammered by the wireless guys. So you say, well, you know, we've had, um, in the very beginning, we had autonomous APs. You'd put the AP out there, you'd turn it on, you'd configure it. But that ended probably about 10 years ago. And now you see you have wireless controllers that sit at a central site, and all of the, of the RF devices that are sitting up in the ceiling are really stupid devices. They're getting all of their instructions from the controller. So it's still pretty much, it's very much the same as controller-based wireless networks. So just looking at some of the controllers that are out there today, um, I, I mentioned a, you know, a open flow based controller. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the open source community, you'll see that the, probably the most common one out there today is called Floodlight. So you can go out to what's called o ONF or the Open Network Foundation. You can download a copy of Floodlight. You can install it on a device, find some switches that are open flow capable, and build your own open flow network. Okay, the controllers are generally free. The Open Daylight Foundation is that second generation or where we are with SDN today. Open Daylight controllers allow those multiple southbound APIs. And once again, you go out, Google Open Daylight, and you can download a free Open Daylight controller. Now, I understand that these are the open source variety, and they're generally limited in what we can do. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So we, what we have here are northbound protocols. Remember, how do you talk to a controller? And you're talking about what's called a REST API. And it's a fairly common programmers are very familiar with this, and the method of connection to that is generally a browser. So either applications can use that REST API to talk to the controller, or you can write your own application as well. And then the southbound APIs, I've talked about these already, OpenFlow, um, SSH, CLI, HTTP, whatever the box understands, is now if you have the appropriate controller, it can use those protocols to talk southbound to the device. And so SDN today, is now not as narrow as it was when it first came out. So what you see we have over here on the left where we talk about strict se uh, separation. That's the initial definition of SDN. Then in the middle here you say application and API centric. This is now where I can use those multiple southbound APIs to talk to the devices. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about another aspect of SDN, and that's called an overlay. And the overlays today are mostly used in the data center, but I'm going to go through a little bit here about how an overlay works. They now all, as you see in the graphic here, roll up to SDN. The good news is, is the northbound API is still exactly the same for all of these things. So the idea now is applications, orchestrators, whatever you have up there, use a common mechanism to talk to the controller, whatever that controller may be, and now it's up to the controller to figure, up this, figure out the specifics of how to talk to the devices that are underneath of it. Anybody have any questions so far? I'll top, stop and take a breath here. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about overlay networks. So how many of you heard about VMware's NSX? Uh, how many of you heard uh, Cisco ACI? How many of you have heard the term of, of VXLAN? Okay, so now I'm going to go back further. How many of you heard of GRE, Genetic Re Generic Router Encapsulation? I think that was at like 1982, something like that, yeah. <laughs> All the things that I've mentioned here are encapsulation technology. Here's one everybody knows, VPN, okay? If you're using a VPN, you're using encapsulation technology. You're encapsulating and you're also uh, encrypting it, but it's still an encapsulation technology. So encapsulation, um, the, the analogy that I use here is if I write a letter, and I'm sorry, what's your name? Oh boy, I picked a bad one, didn't I? Rahel. 
I should have picked a Jane or something. <laughs> if I write a letter and I write down what I want and I hand it to Rahel, that's almost like a layer two network, right? So there's, I don't have to, it's very easy. I can either call out her name or just hand it to her. You know, there, it's very easy to figure out who it goes to. Now, if I'm in North Carolina and I'm writing her a letter, I can't just call out her name and have her pick it up. I have to take that the letter, I have to put it in an envelope, I have to address it in a way that it's going to be delivered here to San Diego, and then when it gets delivered to her office, she opens up the envelope, takes the letter out, and reads it. That's encapsulation. Okay? The letter is the information, the envelope is the, the, essentially the, the, the encapsulation mechanism, the addressing is now what I call the address header, which allows you to get across a more complex network from point A to point B, where I'm going to go ahead and pull that envelope out and she's just going to read the simple letter. So essentially that's what happens in networks as well. So when you look at VXLAN or if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at GRE, if you look at, at, at uh, VPN, it's still the same sort of mechanism. I send the original packet, it gets to some device that understands that in order to get to a different location, I need to put it in an envelope, put another header on it, send it across the network, and then on the other end, they need to know to unencapsulate it and present it you know, to the other end of the network. So overlay networks take advantage of that. And the question then is, is why do we even need overlay networks? And the reason is, is we get back to this agility thing. We get back to this mobility. What are the, probably in networking, what are the two most constraining things that we have out there? I'll give you one, a VLAN, okay? What would another one be? Subnet, there we go. He was going for the coffee. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we built these networks, go back to Stonehenge again, we built it to be stable. When I far, first started going to people and talking to them about networking in, in the early 2000s, we were saying, do layer three down to the access layer. Limit those broadcast storms. You know, anything layer two is bad. Let's make it layer three. And everybody listened to us, and they started building the networks that way. VMware comes along, and they say, hey, we have this product that allows you to run a hypervisor. Well, that's great. And guess what else we can do? We can move a workload from one physical piece of the hardware to another without disrupting the, the operation of that server. That's fantastic. Oh, here's the catch. Both of those physical devices have to be on the same subnet or in the same VLAN. And we're like, okay, well, that's still okay. And then they started saying, you know what? I want to be able to move that workload from this end of the data center to that end of the data center. Now, Chandler's been going in there saying, man, make a subnet out of each rack. So now the server guys are coming back and saying, you've messed me up here because I can only move it from one piece of hardware to another inside of the same rack. What if I want to do a hardware upgrade on that entire rack? I want to be able to move that stuff somewhere else. So now we started going back and saying, all right, well, let's make the, v or let's make the subnets bigger. Let's expand the layer two domain. You know, let's make it so you can move your workloads around. Well, it kept getting bigger and bigger. And now we're back to, if you know anything about subnetting, a lot of people say, I'll just do a slash 16 the whole data center and make it a big flat layer two network. And we all know what happens with that. So it's a bad thing. So how do we fix that? We fix that really by, by using overlay networks. And what an overlay network is, uh, now, now we're going to go back to them again. Say, Remember I told you to make your layer two networks really big? Let's make them really small again, okay? You know, so the network guys are rolling their eyes at us. But the whole idea is I can go back to building those things that from a VLAN or a subnet perspective are safe, are contained, are low broadcast, and I will build a network on top of that physical network. Let's call the physical network an underlay. I'm going to build a network on top of that physical network that's called the overlay. And the overlay is going to be a logical network. And to get from point A over here on the logical network, to point B over here on the logical network, I'm going to have to transit the underlay, and my mechanism of doing that is encapsulation. So I have a graphic up here that I'm going to try. So here's an underlay network. Um, layer 3 IP routed, oops, with a big head in the middle of it. 
um, that essentially it's, it's the physical network. It's the traditional way that we build networks today. And the network segments are isolated by layer three. So if you look up here, I've got a, a blue network, a purple network, a yellow network, and a red network. And the only way to get from one to the other is if I go through that router. So it's a layer three network. So I can't do vMotion from subnet A to subnet B. Remember those, uh, those boxes on the box on the top left, for example, is in the southwest corner of the data center. The one over here is on the northwest. I cannot move the, the workload between them seamlessly, meaning without shutting it down and turning back on again. So how do I fix that? Well, I'm going to take that underlay network and keep it built essentially optimally for that stability. And what I'm going to do is start adding things on top of it. So if you've ever done anything with hypervisors, inside of each hypervisor, there's a virtual switch. So I'm going to take those virtual switches. I'm going to connect them to the physical network. And then I'm going to connect my workloads. Oh, there you go. I'm going to connect my workload just because it's hard to read. These are virtual machines connected to that virtual switch. And I have the virtual switch connected to a physical switch. I still have the same problem. In order to move this machine from here to here, I have to go across this physical network that resides underneath. There's layer three separation. I'm out of luck. So how do I fix that? How do I create something that looks essentially like a single logical network between them? Well, the first thing I have to do is get a controller out. Now, let's go back to the SDN discussion. What does the controller do? It is the control plane or where you do the programming for all of the forwarding engines. So now I have a bad way. I have a control plane here, and these guys are my forwarding engines. Okay? Now, that controller and these engines down here know how to do the encapsulation. All right? So that, that's a key factor there. They have to be capable of doing that. So what I can build in this particular situation is something that looks like this. I have, I'm going to connect this box or this, phys, the, hmm, this virtual switch here to this virtual switch here and make this, the gold network, if you will, is a logical virtual network. And that's great. I really want to be able to do that, but there's no physical connection. How do I really get a packet from this virtual switch over here to this virtual switch over here. And then again, this is essentially the magic of encapsulation. So the encapsulation protocol that we'll use here is VXLAN. And different encapsulation protocols have different properties that make them appropriate for certain situations. For example, if I want to do layer 3 and layer 3, I'll use something like LISP. If I want to do VXLAN, I'm actually taking UDP and putting it, uh, I'm, I'm using UDP as as the encapsulation mechanism. And you know, there's a lot of stuff behind the protocols itself as to do that. But what I'm going to do now is that if I wanted to actually get across the network on this gold network, I'm actually going to take the path that the red dots are showing you there. So up in this corner, they're being encapsulated here. And once they're encapsulated, they're just treated like regular packets by the underlay network. They get delivered to the virtual switch on the other side, still just like an underlay network. He recognizes that as a packet that, belong, that is a VXLAN packet. He de decapsulates it and delivers, delivers it to the, v, or the virtual machine over there. So in essence, this uh, ESX host over here and this ESX host over here reside on the same logical network, and I can perform that, that, that uh, vMotion functionality. So this is one of the key benefits of an overlay network riding on top of the underlay network. OK, so one of the, when you, when you get into distance now, um, and, and we actually, if you go over there, one of those things is what we call the next generation data center. So what we do is we take two physical data centers and we operate them as a single logical data center. And if they're in the same building, not a problem. Yeah, the further you start moving them apart, 
you now have latency, more latency. You can't change, no matter what anybody tries to do, we can't change the speed of light. So at some point, you're going to get to the limits of a number of different technologies. So if you look at VMware, I think there's a 50 millisecond round trip to time limitation to do vMotion. So you ain't going to do that between here and Charleston. Um, you go into what we call it, you know, a G, you go into geo data centers, and at that point, in order to move that workload, you turn it off, you move that image of that machine to Charleston, and you turn it back on again. Okay. So when we talk about, you know, uh, when we talk about, and that's a whole different topic is how do you do active active data centers? Because you have to look at uh, latency requirements for the hypervisor, latency requirements for the vMotion or the or Hyper-V, whatever you want to use, latency requirements for the storage synchronization. You know, I always call it the storage problem. We can figure out, for the most part, the virtualization problems and the network problems. It's very, very difficult to deal with a storage problem because that data has got to reside there because essentially that's what you're talking to. Okay, I'm going to go through a couple things real quick. Another term that you'll hear out there is network function virtualization, or NFV. So NFV is, I'll almost say, the next topic behind SDN. Because now what I can do, you know, since I now can do a lot of things in software, shouldn't I also be able to do functions like load balancing and functions like IPS and functions like firewalling inside of the device itself rather than having individual devices doing that? And the answer to that is we've been doing that for a long time. You know, again, I'm an old Cisco guy, iOS SLB. You know, iOS server load balancing has been around since the late 90s. Why did we move away from it? Because it didn't scale. We eventually had, the way we deployed these load balancers, for example, we had to do it in such a way that I am going to run everything through a device at the head end or at the aggregation layer. So what's changing now that's allowing this technology to come back into play is when you start looking at cloud-based systems and and, and containerizing or creating tenants for individual companies in a cloud environment. Now I don't need to have that big device. I can do it on a virtual device or I can do it within the operating system. So service providers are very, very interested in NFV and I think you'll see a lot of that moving forward but mostly in the space where you're dealing with tenancy or smaller containers. Some of the key players that you see in SDN, and I'll read some of these off, obviously Cisco, and we're starting to see acquisitions as well. So Cisco decided that they really like TailF. I don't know if you ever heard of TailF. TailF was catering mostly to service providers using NetConf as their southbound protocol. So instead of developing, I'm gonna buy it. So uh, same thing with Juniper and Contrail. Uh, Brocade bought Viata, okay? So now you're seeing some of the larger vendors starting to snap up some of the, of the startups that you know, have had that, that freedom to develop and integrate it into their products. You know, VMware, obviously, Nicera. So there's a number of them out there. Uh, Big Switch is probably one of the early uh, entrants into the market, and Big Switch generally uses uh, OpenFlow as their mechanism. So what they're saying is we'll sell you, we're going to sell you software. We're going to sell you the controller. And you'll have your choice of whatever white box vendor you want to use, and we'll go ahead and get that for you, configure it, and, and send it to you. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different model than if you've been used to using a Cisco or an HP or something like that in the past. So, um, wrapping up here, really, what is SDN? And I'll go back to, remember the, the, the tech soup that I had up before? There was all kinds of terms, there's all kinds of acronyms out there. But essentially, if you look at it, it has to be flexible. So, I put that in there, because if you think about the move from open flow only to a controller that allows you to use multiple southbound protocols. And it has to be programmatic, meaning it can't be David pounding in commands and probably incorrectly on a CLI. Uh, and, it, and it has to be really built into a framework so that as we move forward and have new technologies or new mechanisms, we can add that without changing everything at a fundamental level. 
And really, this is, um, it, 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 it has to be able to do something better than the way we're doing it today. And so it, it's really driven by the things that we talked about before. And a lot of people then say to me, well, how do I get started with SDN? And I say, you got two choices here. You can go out and buy a product from a vendor. And, and I really think that, realistically, that's going to be most, the way most people get into SDN. Or you can go build it yourself. How much experience do you have with network operating systems in Python? Okay. And you know, I know that I, my eyes get real big when someone says Python. I, someone told me that if you're over 25, you'll never learn how to program. And I said, what if you're over 50? You know, so um, it probably works in reverse. But what this is, this is a thing from um, Alice in Wonderland. And, and basically, what you also have to understand is if you don't have a reason to do it, don't do it. So this analogy is, you know, Alice basically goes up to the Cheshire Cat and says, you know, what road should I take? And, he sa and, and the Cheshire Cat says, well, where do you want to go? And she says, well, I'm not sure. Then, then he says, it doesn't really matter which way you go then if you don't know where you're going. So we always encourage our customers to have a very solid use case for starting to invest in or starting to travel down this path. Now, at Worldwide, and I'm going to skip over a couple of slides. And by the way, I, I can make these slides available in PDF if anybody wants them. Um, so a couple things that we do at Worldwide is we actually do workshops. So I've given this talk probably 30 or 40 times now over the past two years. Um, we also do much more technical inside of our labs. We have uh, a lot of this stuff set up for to show people or have them explore, both from a We've done some programming. You know, I have some 25-year-olds in there. So um, you know, we've done some programming. We can show, yes, using Python, creating flows in OpenFlow, using simple controllers. And we also have a number of the vendors' products. We have NSX. We have ACI in there as well. So we can really help you understand what these things are. Um, we also have, and I'm going to switch, we also have a actual use case that we're running in our lab. So if you stand up here and do slideware all the time, someone will finally ask you the question, are you actually doing this? And no is a very embarrassing answer in my mind. So we actually, again, sat down and we went through how, what use case do we have at Worldwide? So again, you've probably heard about the ATC and whoever got, I can't believe this, I gave her a card and then she left. Um, but. <laughs> But, but inside of the ATC, what we do is we're always rapidly changing topologies. You know, it's a, it's a large place, it's a 5,000 square foot data center, but we're constantly changing how things are connected together. So we hired a bunch of guys in boxes and boxes of cables, and they would run around and make a change, take them three to four days, probably have to go back and fix it, we'd have to vet it all out. We would do our, our proof of concept, or we'd do our demonstration, Cable guys go back in, rip everything out, put it in the boxes, probably tear out someone else's connection while they're at it. Okay, So next lab comes up, get the same boxes and start cabling up. How do we fix that, and can we make a use case out of it? Well, you can go buy a layer one switch to do that. And I think NetScout may even be here, but they have the on-pass switch. And it's a great box. You just plug everything into it, and on programmatically on the back plane, you can connect those ports together through a software program. And we're going, OK, that's great, but we need to scale it bigger, and we need to spend less money, and we need to tie it into our lab automation system. So our lab automation system, and again, we, the companies over there, it's called Quala Systems, but it has a scheduling component, a resource management component, and a scripting engine. So the end result here is we're using both the native mechanism provided by Quala System with a driver into the layer one switch. And then we also did, here's a Cisco XMC controller. Quala System helped us write a driver to talk to that controller. We wrote code on this switch, essentially, that, that pushes the command from the driver using Python into the northbound API of the controller. And then it then uses OpenFlow to configure the port-to-port -port mapping in the top of rack OpenFlow switches. So we have this hybrid environment of true layer one switching and SDN OpenFlow that's running the cabling aspect in our lab. So now instead of taking three days to cable a lab, we cable it in three minutes. 
And then we also have a service catalog of topologies where I, if someone's cabled it like that before, I just go pick the same topology and I roll it out. To me, this is a great use case for SDN. It's not in our entire network, but we found that this works well, it saves us money, and it, and it certainly saves us both CAPEX and OPEX. Um, if you don't, all right, so if you don't know Python, we're in Python. Uh, <laughs> And, and that's about it, and I'm a little bit over time here. I apologize for that. Does anybody have any questions for our finish? And again, I'll be around this evening. If you have any more questions, be happy to talk to you. Uh, if you'd like to have this presentation in a PDF format, I'll give you my card. You can email me and ask for it. There's a whole lot more in there. I go through the whole process of other forms of network virtualization, uh, but I'm happy for you to have it.